and propositions that were received uh, shortly I will explain these uh, terms of which no analogy exists between them if we think as true based on rational argument that man is living, able to think, and mortal, it is obligatory upon us to conclude that all men are thus, because we did not attribute these qualities to one individual only. On the other hand, if we think as true, based on knowledge that was received, that a man is writing and calculating, it is not obligatory upon us to conclude that all men are thus, since these qualities were attributed to one certain individual. Thus, if theft is prohibited in our reason, it means that every theft is prohibited, since one theft resembles the other. However, if a certain food is prohibited according to our law, it is only that certain food that is thus, and nothing can be inferred from this precept. Sadi applies here the distinction between two types of precepts or commandments, commandments of revelation and commandments of reason. The former means uh, commandments that are known only through revelation and tradition. The latter means commandments that even without revelation would have been known uh, through human reason. According to Saadia, the logical structure of the commandment of revelation resembles that of a particular statement, a statement that was received, namely that has been known to us through someone who was present at the event, such as a certain man writes. On the other hand, the logical structure of a rational commandment resembles the logical structure of a general or rational proposition, such as man is a living being. In the case of a general rational statement, the following syllogism can be put forth. Man is a mammal. All mammals are living beings, therefore, man is a living being. Obviously, claims Sadia, if Socrates is a man, he is necessarily a living being, because as a man, he is a mammal. On the other hand, in the case of a particular or received statement, one cannot induct any valid syllogism that will demonstrate that a certain man, let's say Socrates, necessarily writes. The difference between general and uh, particular statements uh, is understood in light of the Aristotelian theory of syllogism on which Saadia's argument is based. Aristotelian syllogism clarifies the necessary connection between the subject and the predicate in the conclusion of a syllogism. This relation is dependent upon the middle term of the syllogism, the term that connects the two premises of the syllogism. To use Aristotle's example, the proposition, vine leaves are deciduous, is explained and proved through the premises, vine leaves are broad, and all broad leaves are deciduous. The connection between vine leaves and deciduousness, namely the middle term in this syllogism, is therefore the breadth of the leaves. According to this Aristotelian theory, of course, only general scientific propositions can be proven by a syllogism. An accidental statement, such as a certain man writes, in which the subject, a certain man, and the predicate, writes, are not connected through a middle term, cannot be proven by a syllogism. Sadia's argument is that there is no logical basis for applying analogy in the realm of the commandment of revelation. For if the Torah rules, as Sadia exemplified, that a certain food is forbidden, there is no middle term that connects the subject, this food, with the predicate, forbidden. Namely, there is no reason in Arabic Eila for this law. And hence, it is impossible for us to infer that other kind of food that seems similar to the first is forbidden. On the other hand, in the realm of the, of the rational precepts, our knowledge is indeed derived syllogistically from general principles of ethics that are rooted in human reason. For example, the third ethical principle of the rational commandments that Saadia discusses in his book of Beliefs and Opinions is that uh, we would avoid from causing harm and damages to other, to other persons. He goes on to explain that this ethical principle underlies the prohibition of theft in Leviticus 19.11, do not steal. The quality of theft as 
a sort of damaging other people is the mini term that explains the connection between the case, stealing, and its law, forbidden. When we say that stealing is condemnable, we do not distinguish between cases of stealing with particular and or accidental characteristics, such as stealing during daytime, stealing during nighttime, uh, etc. Rather, any way of removing property from the hands of its owner without his knowledge or cons or, and consent is considered condemnable, as we saw in the words of Saadia cited by Kirkisani. Kirkisani chose a different course of legal methodology. In the fourth article of his legal theological book, Kitab al Anwar wal Harakim, Kirkisani analyzes logical and epistemological principles that are valid in science and, according to Kirkisani, can be applied in the domain of the legal interpretation of scriptures. Kirkisani emphasizes in this context the central place of Aristotelian syllogism and he applies it as a mean by which the adjudicator is able to carry out a rational, logical procedure of interpreting the law of scripture or even inferring new laws from, uh, from the law of the scripture. This procedure is based on a logical analysis of the reason that forms the connection between a given case and the law which the Torah enacted concerning it. This reason is the legal cause, again in Arabic, Ila, of the precept. Once the adjudicator identified the legal cause, he can and must execute it. Namely, he must apply it to other cases in which the same cause exists. For example, Kikisani says, a group of our fellows among the people of speculation applied it, namely the Kiyas, to the precepts, like uh, Benjamin and Hawandi and others. For example, the prohibition of sexual relations for a person with his uh, uh, brother's or sister's daughter, based on two premises and conclusion. And that is, by the saying of the Torah, yeah, the nakedness of your father or the nakedness of your mother you shall not uncover. That is a premise which means that the Torah prohibits a person whoever, uh, uh, whoever is sexually prohibited to his father or to his mother. The second premise is it's saying the nakedness of your son's daughter or your daughter's daughter, their nakedness you shall not uncover. For, uh, for, uh, uh, theirs is, uh, for theirs is your nakedness. And that is a second premise, which means that the daughter's daughter and the son's daughter both are sexually prohibited to the grandfather. The conclusion from this is that my brother's daughter and my sister's daughter are sexually prohibited to me since they are both prohibited to my father. And whoever is prohibited to my father is prohibited to me. Later on, Kikisani explains his legal method. He says, since this is as we said, namely, that every precept has a cause, and we know the precept's cause and its purpose, either by explicit text or by other means, it is obligatory then to apply the cause to its effect. Uh, later on, he explains, uh, similarly, the Torah's words yeah, if a man uh, makes a hole in the earth without covering it up, and an ox or an ass falls into it, yeah, comes uh, to its death, the owner of the hole is held responsible. People have to make payment to their owner. We know that its cause is that one who made a hole and did not cover it and caused damage to people has to pay compensation. The application of the cause the application of the cause in these two matters, the object that caused the damage and the object that was damaged, is to extend the law of an ox and an ass to every piece of energy, a sheep or a camel, and to extend the law of the whole to everything that causes damage, fire, animal, implying wall, and the like. In this controversy over the validity of legal inference, Saadi and Kirkisani both stand out as rationalists although of different kinds. In Kirkisani's opinion, all precepts have a cause, wherefore logical inference is applicable to the entire world of halakha. 
in this view, the Talmudic tradition becomes redundant and useless. Saadi, on the other hand, is willing to admit that rational precepts are organized syllogistically. But Saadia's rationalism goes only to the extent that it does not undermine tradition and the authority of Talmudic law. According to Saadia, then, the laws that are known through revelation and tradition cannot be deduced by logical inference. Our knowledge of them is dependent upon the tradition, namely the Talmud. In conclusion, let me add that the controversy over the legitimacy of analogy between Saadia and Pekisani can be characterized as a good use of kalam. Kalam literally means speaking, conversing. And according to uh, one of the researchers of kalam, Joseph Van Es, it means being involved in an argument. Not literally, kalam means Muslim theology. It is the science by which one supports one's religious tenets and doctrines with rational arguments. Saadia and Kirkisani were both influenced by the science of Kalam that was prevalent in their time, and their application of Aristotelian logic in their religious debate is a good example of the creativity of these two Jewish theologians, Arabic yeah, Mutat and of the rational scientific basis of the Karai Rabbanite controls. Thank you. Kikisani is really a rationalist. And if you're really a rationalist, you don't need tradition. You can analyze, you can analyze the law through human reason and extend it and apply it. And, and uh, uh, I think the rabbinites, uh, maybe uh, uh, Saadia, he had the necessity um, to qualify uh, this rationalism. So, in matters of theology, Saadia was a rationalist. But in matters of law, he had the necessity to defend the Talmud. Here you see he is applying arguments that came from the, uh, the, the most conservative schools of Islam, a matter that was, uh, that was shown by uh, Moshe Tsukir and others. Um, Versus of law, he is much more traditionalist, and the 
my instance, he uh, uh, applied uh, distinctions taken from Aristotle to show that not every statement can be proven by a so Sadia was against uh, applying syllogism in Mitzvot um, in So how did he explain all the Talmud and Midrashim using this syllogism in those cases? Mm -hmm. What was is this Talmud? Basically, mm -hmm. what he says is that everything that looks as a syllogism, as a Hekesh, is just a, a way of arguing, of, of, of expressing the tradition. He says in his commentary on, on the Viticus that uh, was not published yet, five paragraphs were published by Moshe Tzukel, he says that all, the, all we find in the Talmud and Mishnah and in Moshe al and so on is tradition. And there was a way of connecting the Halakha, which came through tradition and scriptures, together. But uh, there is no uh, uh, creative midrash. There's only Midrash Masmik. These are not his words, but this. He says that explicitly, or so? Yes. Certain theory about Midrash. Yes, yes. He holds that. He has this view. Because he has. He lied on the reason and not called. Again? He lied. It's only explanation and not called. That depends who you ask. Okay, in Greek is sunny. What did you say? I don't want to take something. Okay. In Greek is sunny. Ila means also legal cause and also the legal purpose. And in your side, it distinguishes between the cause and the purpose. Can I, can I give a short example? Short example. Uh, uh, in the book of Biritz and the Sadi says that even though uh, without revelation, we would have known that we are uh, that God wants us to keep shadows. Once we know, we are obligated to uh, 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 to observe the the, the, the shimiyot. We can see their purpose. For example, the purpose of Shabbat and Yom Tov is well, we rest, we uh, spend time with the family, we gather the congregation together, we learn Torah publicly, and so on. So now uh, we must ask ourselves can we infer the laws of Yom Tov from the laws of Shabbat? Because they have the same purpose, the answer is no. <coughs> Yeah, for in Shabbat it is uh, prohibited to cook, and in Yom Tov it is permitted. So, if we want to look at what God wants from us, we cannot look at the purposes. We must look at the the means, the reason of the means. This is the, this is the cause. And what He says it, in the Shemiot, there's no there's no cause when we examine the means. Uh, Kirkisani, on the other hand, will say that there is no difference between purpose and cause. If we know that it is prohibited to, uh, 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 to uncover a hole in the ground, uh, the purpose is the cause. Uh, we can say that it is prohibited to throw a, 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 yes, a, a, a banana on the ground. Thank you very much. Thank you.